So anyway, let's get right on to the uh, language design panel with uh, a bunch of uh, industry legends here. Uh, and me. <laughs> and you. <laughs> now, uh, for those watching at home, I am keeping an eye on Discord down here. So if you have any questions for the panel, please go ahead. We also have guys with microphones around the room. You guys know the drill. You've been doing it for two days now. Uh, but let's uh, kick off this panel uh, with a bit of a fun question uh, for language design. Why does everything look like C? It doesn't. <laughs> well, not everything, but let, let's say a lot of systems programming languages do, for example. So why does everything that I use look like C? Oh, that's an easy one, because everybody thinks they can replace C, and nobody's going to touch anything that doesn't look like, like what they're used to. Yeah, basically, people are used to it, and so it's an obvious choice for the next language design. People are familiar with it, and... Uh, yeah, it works despite its uh, inconsistencies and things like that. It's still uh, comfortable. It works. Um, you don't really have to uh, spend a lot of time documenting it or explaining explaining it to people. So yeah, it's, it's I, just easy. I guess it's why why does everything look like Algol really? <laughs> <laughs> Some things don't. You know, Lisp is still alive. So. Uh, well, I mean, let's follow that through. Like uh, with Lua, why did you uh, choose a different syntax to C then? Exactly, because <laughs> not everything looks like C. <laughs> and, and back then, Lua is very old. Well, back then, more than today, a lot of things didn't look like C. Uh, for instance, I, I, I think I mentioned that, for instance, that thing about the, the one indexing, that famous one indexing, that most of our users were Fortran programmers, and for them, nothing looks like C. <laughs> yeah. Well, I so, never liked the begin end of Pascal. It just seems silly to be typing all those letters for the opening and close brace. Yeah, I mean, I guess you have bash scripts as well, where like branches are like if this, and then to end the branch, it's F I, like it's in reverse. Yeah. Like, it's, why? I don't get that myself. Why would anybody design it like that? <laughs> uh, sure, it's cute, but it's like, why bother? Yeah, but ESSEC is even worse. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, surely we must have an audience question by now, I guess, and unless you guys want to rant about something along those lines. Oh, we have one audience question over here. Uh, what's, uh, for, for anyone on the panel, what's a language that you really admire that you don't work on? Oh, what a great question. Common Lisp. Oh, I, that I would disagree. Scheme. <laughs> sure, okay. Okay. Scheme is simpler. Fair enough. Also, question marks are a lot better than a stupid P to signify a question. Predicate. I mean, that makes no sense. Okay, fine. Scheme. And another that I admire, I work a little, but not much, is Haskell. I, I am a big admirer of Haskell. I have to say I like assembly language, but it's just... Uh, <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Which one? I, my favorite was always the PDP-11. PDP-11 always had just uh, the nicest uh, instruction syntax, uh, very orthogonal, um, a lot of fun to write code in uh, uh, PDP-11 assembler. But I don't do it anymore because, well, <laughs> PDP-11 is uh, long since passed into history. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you can see its influence on the x86 instruction set. There's a lot of 11-like stuff in there, but they got a lot of it wrong. Like, the x86 superficially looks like it, but they didn't get the idea of, of an orthogonal register set. Every register is, uh, has custom instructions for it. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess slightly related to that, like uh, uh, an old programming teacher was writing his own scripting language and he loved the idea of reverse Polish notation. Um, so have, have you guys ever actually considered doing something like that? Or do you, do you think anybody might ever be interested in something like that? No. <laughs> what do you mean, a programming language? Ah, uh, yeah, he had a full scripting language where you'd push arguments to the stack and then operators yeah, and then pop things from the know, stack like, and, yeah. Like fourth? I think... Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure. But. Yeah, but fourth is like that. I like that. Okay. I, I think it's for what it is, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It's ridiculously small, much smaller than Luin, <laughs> and it's, it has its uses, I think it's... Well, when I was in college, the calculators had just come out, and there was a great debate between the HP 35, which had RPN notation, for entering and the TI, which used the infix notation, and there were adherents to both parties, to both forms, always arguing about which one was superior, and nobody was ever converted from one to the other. <laughs> Uh, are, are we ever going to see dependent typing and proof assistance in mainstream languages, or do you think it's overhyped? Um, well, I can't predict the future, um, but probably not, just given how complicated it is. I mean, Haskell's simpler than that, and people do use it in industry, but it's not you know, widespread. And I think a good part of the reason why is because it's complicated. Uh, I think I'm going to quote um, someone I know in Tel Aviv University um, that it's going to be the future and it's always going to be the future. <laughs> yes, I, I, I kind of agree, yes. Even the Java, the, the, the generic stuff in, in Java, I think it's already too too complex for a lot of people. It, uh, I think it, it, you have to change a lot the industry to, to make those things important. Uh, I have a question. At uh, DCOF 2017 on a panel, uh, Walter predicted that the lack of memory safety is going to kill C. And I'm curious, Roberto, what uh, you think about that. Do you think uh, that's true? Uh, will C die because of a lack of memory safety, or is it going to stick around and persist uh, forever? I, I don't think C will stick around, but also I don't think that the problem is memory safety. I think there are some other problems, but, but memory safety, it's, it's still... Uh, I would like... To, to believe that memory safety would be solved by, by languages, but I don't think this is a, a, a real trend currently. I think still people believe in memory safety by hardware. But I mean, just you have isolation and then inside your process, it's your problem that, 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 that if you don't bother with the memory of other, other processes. So I think, I mean, it's good. I, I am uh, I'm a big in favor of memory safety in languages, but uh, I think that the, that's not a, a crucial property of, unfortunately, I mean, it should be, but it's, I don't think any language will die because of that. When I, but, when I look at lists of... Uh, Security vulnerabilities, uh, buffer overflow is always number one by yeah, a large yeah, margin. It is, yes. And C doesn't have buffer overflow mm. protection. No, I agree, completely agree. But my point is that, unfortunately, correctness and, and things like that are not top priorities in software development, I think. Okay. Security, etc. It should be. That's what I what I mean. It should be, but it's not. It's not. I don't think it's even today. It's still not uh, economically a good thing to do very good software. It's much cheaper to do bad software. I mean, not bad, but reasonable good software, and and that's that's enough. It it doesn't pay off to 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 do software. 
above certain level of quality. The, the, the software engineering always says about quality, etc., cetera, et cetera. But the, the economics of software development nowadays, it's, it still doesn't pay that. Now if all those uh, uh, data breaches and things like that, it's becoming more expensive to have bugs, etc. But it's still, the, the, the balance is still, I think for most kind of software, it's still much cheaper to do something reasonable and faster than to, to, to waste a lot of resources to, trying to, to cover all bugs, etc. cetera. The, the cost, it's very low for, for bad software. The interesting thing about that is, you know, uh, when NASA puts code on a, on a rover, uh, that, that software is ridiculously expensive to yes, write. Yes, but that's not the, the that's not sure. a ninety percent sure, of, of, of all software you write. But I just yes, there are some very specific cases that sure. it pays, but for most software that people write every, every day, it pays even to write in Lua. That's why people use. <laughs> right, but it, but even in the NASA case, they don't change languages. So even even though in their case it costs so much, they they just have procedures around uh, writing the code, which I find interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, because there is this this difference. I, I, once uh, I, I think someone asked the you know it was fun. I think it was a panel whether I would uh, I would fly in in, in, a, in a plane using Lua in the system. I would be crazy. I mean, I, not. <laughs> I, I will not fly it in any plane of a company that uses the Lua even <laughs> in another different airplane. Because, I mean, come on, that's not that's not the goal. But but I think that in general the 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 the, 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 the economics are, are, are most softer. It still doesn't deserve. It's, it, it doesn't pay to to be well tested and et cetera. It's much, as they say, just turn off, turn on again, and keeps going. And I think it's a little better now, but, it, but it's still, most software, it's still cheaper. It's better to do it cheap. And well, adding uh, memory protection is not expensive. And it, and the idea is that you don't have to test it to not have security vulnerabilities because the compiler will ensure it for you for a memory safety. I don't know, maybe, but the, the, the types might not be expensive, but it, 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 it demands more, I mean, more thinking about it. It's, it's, yeah. Oh, it's, that's true. And yeah. you still have logic box that the type system can't protect you from. So, yeah. That, well, I'm mainly talking about uh, security vulnerabilities, and people trying to stop that from happening is a very expensive industry. Yeah. And when you do have a security vulnerability and you get some ransomware, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you've got to pay a ton of money to the the ransomware people, yes, that yes. is a very uh, costly thing to have a yes. buffer overflow bug. Yes, that, that's a, 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 what I, I, I try to mention that that I've data breaches and etc. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. I think it's changing the balance, but I think it's still people still didn't get that. How uh, is that? How much expensive a, a bug can be? Because in the, uh, a bug in the wild it, it's still very cheap, but when someone gets the bug and explores, mm -hmm. that can be very expensive. So. That's the, 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 the yeah. for but those that like quality, it's a, a hope that's, <laughs> that may put more pressure on, on good software, but, but I think it's still, most people still do not get it. I just wanted to add that you can also add some form of mitigations at hardware level instead of changing the language itself. You can do things like pointer authentication and, and just, um, you know, preventing. I mean, I mean, there, there's many, many mitigations, and that's easier than changing a language or changing the way we make software. Collect at, at a global scale, it feels cheaper to change the underlying hardware if that has no consequences on how software is written. Um, so I, I think that adds to what you are saying that that 
might not suffer bugs, might not have consequences that might drive us to another language. Yeah, they, they, that's the. I think that's the trend. That that that, that uh, really is the trend. But I, I don't like that. I, I mean, I, I agree with. I mean, it it should be cheaper and more and better to solve that in in, in software, because in hardware sometimes you get to uh, the restriction. For instance, one common problem we have all the time is that you restrict that you cannot change the code. For instance, you cannot change the, the, the code is static, and then, for instance, you cannot do JIT compilation in the machines because of that kind of restriction. So there, I think the, the, when you do in, impose in their hardware, you end up restricting uh, sometimes much more than you, you wanted. It's that kind of solution that it's a, it's a poor, poor, poor man's solution because it's a kind of, okay, nobody's going to do anything better, so that's the, that's the least we can do. But it is, so I, I agree. I think that the, the, the trend is that. I think that's, that's what's going to happen. That's what I said about memory safety, that you have the, the hardware imposed limits. So you can blow up your own process, but as long as you are isolated from other processes, it doesn't matter. But it's, it's a, yeah. in an ideal world, you, maybe you shouldn't even need memory protection, because if the, the languages ensure everything, there, there are some dreams about that, for instance, with uh, Oberon and languages like that in the past. But uh, well, um, I see a definite trend in modern languages over the years of uh, replacing error-prone constructs or things that are shown to be error-prone with uh, less error-prone constructs. And I see that in every language except C, which resists these kinds of changes. Um, I've proposed a way to do uh, buffer overflow checking in C, and it generates just simply zero interest from the, the C community. Um, but I also see uh, C being used less and less because people are drifting away to uh, more advanced languages and languages with uh, uh, safer uh, features in them. Um, I think eventually all that will be left of C is uh, that's how languages will communicate with each other is through the C ABI, but nothing will actually be implemented in C. <laughs> but, you know, even simple things like the uh, talk earlier today about ch uh, changing the way that we do concurrent programming, so it's, it's composable. And I mean, that's a big advance in uh, reducing the errors in concurrent programming. And I think, you know, that's a very exciting development. Uh, structured programming that replaced go-to programming was all in an effort to uh, reduce very error-prone constructs and replace them with things that are less, um, more uh, human-friendly, I guess, so people make less mistakes. And, you know, I some people don't like me making these analogies, but it's a lot like uh, airplane cockpit design. It's evolved over the years, and it's evolved not because uh, cockpit designers are getting smarter. It's because we, the air aviation industry, has uh, learned from the mistakes. Every every accident and crash and everything like that goes back to how can we prevent this from happening. And often it means altering the design of the uh, way the instruments and the controls work in the cockpit to minimize uh, the human error component because you can't really fix people, but you can fix their human interfaces so they're less likely to make mistakes. And as a result, uh, flying airplanes is incredibly, uh, incredibly safe today, but that's been an evolution over 120 years of uh, continual refinement based on making mistakes and then don't want to make those mistakes anymore. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, slightly related to this, uh, I mean, we've got uh, 
two languages here uh, on the stage uh, that have garbage collection in them. And they're both for very different domains, but they seem to have the same usage here. But uh, D being a systems language, like for example, the last DConf, uh, we had, uh, what was that talk about getting D into the Linux kernel? And, and that basically needed to run uh, with better C, uh, just to avoid garbage collector and a bunch of the other runtime stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, case to be made for having um, garbage collection in a systems language, but then you have things like a Linux kernel, which can have uptimes of years that, you, you know, a garbage collector might not work so well. So um, uh, how much, uh, how much, uh, how well do you think a garbage collector actually fits into a systems language, for example? Well, take that first. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> D is a multi-paradigm language, and the advantage of the garbage collector, and it's been brought up in a couple of the talks just today, is if you just want to write code and get it to work, the garbage collector is your friend, because you just don't want to be bothered with trying to figure out what is the exact lifetime of of this uh, piece of memory I'm allocating. I, I just want to... I just want to get my uh, program to work and get it done and, and out the door, and the garbage collector or garbage collected language is very uh, uh, efficient at minimizing the time you spend programming because you just don't have to worry about the memory allocation on it. You just allocate memory and use it and don't worry about it. And But if you're writing code that's going to be long-lived and uh, you want to guarantee it, you know, all garbage collectors have a... Uh, possibility of wedging themselves. Um, you never want that to happen. Uh, you don't have to use the garbage collector. You can do stack allocation. You can do chain allocation, those other uh, schemes I mentioned. You can write your own storage allocator and use it. It's all there, but it all comes at an, an additional effort in programming on it. So with D, you can do it either way or do it like what most people do with D is they do a mixture of the two. Usually I'll use the garbage collector if I don't really want to be concerned with the lifetime of it. But if I know the lifetime, I'll use uh, explicit allocation for it. I think this is akin to saying, um, yeah, this fancy new language C, this sounds great, but in my embedded system, I'm not allowed to do dynamic memory allocation. So how does a language with malloc and free fit into this? Don't, don't do it. All right. Uh, we actually have a question from uh, Stephen uh, Schweighofer. I might have mispronounced that too. Uh, what is a feature that you love in a different language that you wish you could bring into your favorite language? Uh, I know one that you never, there is no way that it could come into Lua, which is pattern matching from functional languages. But that needs a good type system, etc. That it's everything that Lua lacks. So it's, I don't think any way to to put that in. But I, I think that's very very interesting that you you have cases and you have destructs all in one construction. It's it's really nice. Well, I'd like to uh, simply be able to import C. We've been successful at importing C code directly, and I'd love to be able to import C++ code directly and interface to it in, as, in such an easy way, easy and painless way. So I think uh, interactivity between D and C++ would be uh, a really nice feature to have, but technically uh, it's, it's quite a challenge to make it work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's definitely a goal, but I think the spirit of the question is like a C++ feature instead of just interacting with the code. So what kind of a feature would is kind of missing from D, I guess, that you would really like in? Well, I think uh, pattern matching and tuples are kind of high on the list of features D ought to have. Probably something like uh, traits for compile time interfaces, so that you can say that, you know, accept this. I mean, we've got the uh, ifs after the function to say if is input range, but basically it's it's so far away removed from where the template argument is, it would be nice that you could specify, I take a T that is a, for instance, forward range of int, because some t or even constant, even better, 
uh, or yeah, something like that. I think that would be cool. No, it's a hard question because um, most of my problems with DR are things that are not misfeatures, but like bad use cases or stuff that are hard. But um, I guess um, interfacing with C++ would have made my life a lot more easier um, in a recent project I had. And being able to avoid the runtime completely and use C++ uh, templated structures instead would have made my life easier instead of implementing everything from scratch. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I would like to see uh, first class types in CTFE code because that would eliminate virtually 90% of my templates. And I actually have a theory that it would um, make metaprogramming an easier entry point for most people because they just need to be writing D code instead of learning how to write templates. I want to go back in time and steal your thing. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Manu were talking about it yesterday. Uh, we got a couple of questions down the front here, and uh, we do have a confirmation from Ian that fourth is RPN, and it's kind of closer to assembly than C. So yes, you were correct. Uh, so uh, kind of a bit of background. So the thing that uh, attracted me to D was uh, metaprogramming, uh, and then I was uh, kind of uh, sad to discover that uh, most of metaprogramming you do is by constructing strings. Uh, uh, so uh, my question is basically, what is your view on uh, kind of modern static metaprogramming with types and uh, specifically like multi-staged uh, macros where you can have types on different stages and uh, guarantee that you are building kind of uh, correct sound code, even your generated code will be sound. Like, do you see uh, any like possibility D getting modern uh, metaprogramming like that? Um, what I... The only way I can think of to do more metaprogramming like that without using strings is doing uh, macros. And I guess uh, most people know my opposition to macros and in the language and why. So I'm not sure I see that happening with D unless a another way is found to do it. Um, I will point out that, uh, are you familiar with uh, expression templates in C++? Yeah, well, you can actually do that in D. I tried it out just to see if uh, D templates were powerful enough to do expression templates, and they are. But I don't recommend doing expression templates, but uh, as something to play with and uh, investigate, I think it would be uh, interesting and illuminating. Uh, but I don't really want to go to macros because uh, a bitter experience with what happens eventually always with macros is uh, very discouraging. I'm not sure most metaprogramming D is done with strings anyway. Um, at least for me, most of mine is done with static map and static filter and basically, you know, template met meta functions. Uh, what makes it harder there is you don't have template lambdas, so you have to give it a name first, define it out of band and then use it later. And then there's some issues with compile times and symbols being generated. So um, yeah, it depends on who's doing the metaprogramming, I guess. But what would make that a lot simpler is what we were talking about before with uh, types being first class and you just write regular decode instead of well, writing functions instead of meta functions. All right, we're about halfway through the panel. How's it feeling, guys? Enjoying it? Yeah. It's fun. Cool. Just having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. One of the most successful features of D is a unit test uh, being made first class and known to the compiler. Do you think there are other kind of annotation that programmers use that could be made first class in a similar positive way? Uh, I don't know. I never thought about that, but you're right that building in unit tests and it's uh, and the documentation generator have been uh, uh, transformative in how D programs were uh, how D programming is done. Uh, before we had the built-in documentation generator, the documentation Phobos was 
Uh, 100% uh, wrong, misleading, or uh, completely missing. Uh, even there was even documentation for functions that were uh, applied to the wrong function. You know, somehow they would get disconnected from each other. Uh, building the documentation generator into the language itself completely fixed all that. And you know, unit testing, the unit built-in unit test has been maligned for not being powerful enough, but it's it's like. Uh, going from a horse and buggy to a propeller airplane, uh, sure, jets are better, you know, but still, the propeller airplane is infinitely better than uh, going cross-country by horse and buggy. <laughs> but I'm not really sure what other feature would uh, would fit in with that as, as a built-in. But if you have any, any ideas on that, I'm interested. Oh, hey, we've got a question from uh, the bot here. Um, with the rise of popularity of Rust, where do you see the future of D? Despite the missing garbage collector in Rust, both kind of target the same audience. Well, that is a great question. And, uh, you know, Rust has uh, seen a lot of popularity. Uh, one thing that, uh, well, D has a prototype borrow checker in it, and the memory safety is a goal. We're not as far as long, along as Rust is, but one thing D has going forward is the familiar syntax. It's very easy to uh, uh, transition from C to D or from uh, C++ to D because the syntax is so familiar. Well, my biased opinion, obviously, is that it's easier to write D code because you don't uh, need to worry about lifetimes if you have a GC. It's just simpler. I mean, there's a reason why there's blog posts about how to, I think, write a linked list in Rust because it's a lot harder. And whereas if you have a GC, um, it's easier. Also, concurrent algorithms become a, a lot, lot easier if you have a GC because you don't need to worry about that or, or cycles. So I think that they're very good at what they're doing, which is to provide memory safety without a GC. I would say that I'm not entirely sure that that is you know, that useful because in most cases when people think they can't afford a GC, they can. Yes, there are cases in which you can't, but then there are ways around that as well. So I guess that's, that's how I view us there. Uh, simpler to use for most cases and um, we can also you know, bypass a GC. But we've got some work to do there too. Um, I'll just extend that um, similarly to the question I've been asked about um, lockless um, data structures. Um, basically, what happens is that when you don't have a GC, you're you know, going to have a lot of pain trying to figure out when should things be deleted because somebody still might own a pointer to that um, structure and you're going to have to figure out when you are able to delete it safely without breaking everything. So a garbage collector really helps there. One of, one of the troubles with uh, Rust is if you want to convert your program to Rust, you cannot just transliterate it. You often have to redesign your algorithms and data structures to be compatible with the borrow checker, and uh, that imposes a large uh, transition cost. With I've converted a lot of uh, C and C++ code to D, and it actually goes very quickly. Uh, yeah, let's do your question, Armory, and then I've got another one from the chat. Yeah, so I was wondering, like, it seems to me we are in an industry that does a lot of cargo cult uh, more than, uh, you know, actually verifying, you know, if the good practice are actually good. And, like, a few remarks that you made, uh, like all of you, not someone in particular, earlier, kind of reminded me of that. So I was wondering, um, what do you think... Um, is an, actually a bad practice that the industry in general like, considers as you know, some best practice or something that we should all be doing? Well, one, one practice I've started uh, adopting in my own code is uh, a single assignment. Um, normally, 
out of a long-standing habit, I, I would tend to recycle variables. Like I need a new variable, a new uh, variable to hold an integer. Oh, look, I've already declared i. I'm not using it anymore, so I'll just reuse i over here. I I think that's a. Uh, uh, I've come around to the conclusion that that's an execrable practice. And if you can rewrite your code or or just do a minor refactor and so that you're only assigning a variable once, not multiple times, I think your code is uh, much re more readable, more understandable, and uh, less error prone if you do that. So uh, although that's a, it, it's kind of a little thing if you tend to write complicated code, I think it's kind of a big deal to uh, to do this. I fully agree. And anyway, SSA will do that anyway, yeah, so it's, it's very you it, it's, easy it, the job. Of. It's SSA, single static assignment. It's a, it's a good idea, and it's one that never occurred to me years ago. I'm trying to think it's something that's industry wide, but the only thing I'm thinking of that is common in some code bases and rules is you know one return per function, which is just incredibly stupid. Sorry, which one, one return per function, only one return to yeah. um, Thankfully, I've never seen it. <laughs> but um, regarding the SSA, um, I do have one problem trying to write like this, which is the fact that I can't reuse the names and then you know, I like I have X and X one and X one one X one 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 one, and you know it it doesn't really <laughs> scale like that. Um, and the practice that I think that uh, the, um, is forbidding forbidding go to, where it actually has some really nice uh, use case when you need to jump out of multiple loops. Yeah, um, I sometimes still use go to. For that, <laughs> we know. <laughs> uh, do you have a better way to do it? Uh, I'd have to look at the code right now. Not really. Yeah, one one time I, uh, you know, a long time ago when I was working working for a company, they uh, we had a code review meeting, and one of the other people had uh, done a grep for all the go to. In the in the code I'd written, and then just showed it as a list on printed it out. And it was a list on a piece of paper of you know all these go to things, and he basically said, "You're a bad programmer. You're using all sorts of go tos." And <laughs> one of my friends says, "Yeah, but by definition, you took all of these go tos out of context. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know why the go to was there or what problem it was solving." <laughs> I think cargo culting in general is, is, is problematic. Just always think about what you're doing. Don't blindly follow any rule, including the ones you wrote yourself. Uh, it's like saying go to is always bad. Never use go to, but you're in a C code base and you're trying to clean up. Well, the easiest way you can do that is by doing a go to. Uh, um, a, a lot of people ask me for lists of uh, principles on how to write code, and I'll write a list of principles. And then one of two things will happen. They'll tell me I'm violating these principles. <laughs> or they will follow the principles without thinking about it and drive off a cliff with it and then say that the principle is bad. And one thing I always, and I admit a lot of the principles are contradictory. And so I guess I, I try to impress, impress upon people to don't blindly follow any programming style rules or anything like that. It's uh, Those are guidelines, and use your best judgment on this. Don't let the rule override your judgment, because you'll, you'll just drive it off a cliff if you do that. My favorite example is I worked on a project that was called SLA. It doesn't really matter what it was doing, what it stands for, but that was the name of the project, and this uh, is important because in the code base, they had a hash define SLA underscore TWO to the number two. Because they use the number two somewhere, and in code review, somebody went magic number, <laughs> define <laughs> SLA2, two. Because that obviously solves the problem. 
Exactly what I'm talking about. Blind adherence to the programming style guidelines. They also define SLA new line to, you know, backslash N. Just, just in case that changed. <laughs> and that's past code review? <sighs> Somehow, yes. <laughs> It's the blind leading the blind. I mean, you know, somebody's driving off the cliff, the other one's there too. It's like, oh, GPS says this way. Okay, woo. I, I think good rules are the ones that you, you, that give you the reason to think about what, why you are breaking them. So you can break them, but you, you have to, I mean, you really think, you know, that, this sounds good. Why I'm not following it? And then you, it forces you to think about. And sometimes you can break, but you, it forces you to understand really what's going on. And sometimes even you decide, oh, I don't need to break that rule. Actually, I, 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 I just can solve the problem in a better way. But if you break, at least you, you, it forces you to, to think more about what you're doing. But those are the good rules that are not that common. <laughs> well, it, it sort of is like the rules of how you learn things. The, the newbie follows the rules because he's told to. Uh, the master follows the rules because he understands the point of the rules. Mm -hmm. And the guru breaks all the rules because he understands that the rules don't apply. <laughs> he transcends the rules. So... <laughs> So, yeah, I think the best rule is just think. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, when I was, uh, you know, teaching somebody to drive, uh, and they said, well, what do I do in this situation? Because avoiding the accident would break the law. And I said, <laughs> if you're avoiding the accident, break the law. <laughs> you know, so the law is a law. The law doesn't provide exceptions for this. It's like... If I see three people walking address, uh, abreast, sticking into my lane, I, if the other lane is clear, I will move all the way over into opposing traffic to not hit them. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm breaking the law doing that. But, you know, I'd much rather break the law than, uh, you know, run somebody over. And it's the same in programming. Yeah, that's the weirdest take in the trolley problem I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so this is a question going back to the macros. Um, AST macros uh, instead of text-based macros, uh, do you still feel those are harmful? Yes, and as an example, I give expression templates, which are basically AST macros. And uh, one of my favorite bad examples of that is a boost example, which turns C++ into a regex language. And the problem with it, and... Uh, the authors were very proud of this, is you couldn't tell what was C++ and what was regex. So what happens when you have AST macros is, uh, well, you wind up inventing your own language. And when you wind up inventing your own language, people don't document it. So what happens is, and I've seen this effect many times, is people invent their own language, they write their program in their own undocumented quirky language, then they leave the company, and this is dropped into the lap of some poor schlub who's supposed to try to figure out and fix bugs with it, and what happens is they wind up throwing it in the trash and starting over. Uh, my favorite story on this was a friend of mine worked at Microsoft, and... He was given this job of giving, uh, fixing a bug in a 50K executable. And the executable was all written in uh, Microsoft Assembler, and the programmer had invented his own macro language, and the whole thing was written in this macro language. And programmer after programmer had been assigned to fix this bug in it, and after uh, six weeks of trying to figure it out, they'd give up. And so... He was telling this to my friend. My friend goes, oh, I can fix it. So he hands it to him, and then two hours later, he had it fixed, and the source code checked in. And he goes, well, how did you fix, how did you figure out his macro language? And he said, I didn't. 
I assembled it, I ran it through a disassembler that generated source code, I found the bug, fixed it, and checked in the disassembled code as the new source code for the project. So this, this is one of the pivotal moments in my uh, evolution to disliking macro languages. And, and I've seen that story repeat itself again and again in various contexts with the macros in different languages. It's even in my own code. I used to use lots of very clever macros in it. And in the process of transitioning it to D, the first step was to get rid of the macros because uh, macros don't translate very well. So I rewrote in ordinary C code, instead of using the macros, and I had the epiphany that my code was a lot more readable and understandable when I didn't use clever macros in it. So that added to it, too. So yeah, my uh, position on macros is getting harder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I find that people just invent their own language anyway if you don't have macros, but it just has, happens to have the same syntax. But that makes a big difference. Uh, sure. At, yeah. At, well, at, at, when you at least you can read the syntax. I mean, it, it's when you cannot not, not even parse <laughs> someone else's program. It's much worse. I think that's a big problem with macros that you yeah. cannot even parse there. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly macro related, but thanks to Op Dispatch in D, uh, one of the things that we blow people's minds with is like, here, we've integrated Lua, and then you can just write out a Lua function in D code, and then it interprets that string at compile time and calls into your Lua function. So, yeah, it's kind of unrelated, but kind of cool. Well, one thing I have found is that people find ways to do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but by by not al allowing a macro processor in there, I make it difficult for them to do and try to discourage them from doing it. The life finds a way. <laughs> and you always have the option of using a M4 as a yeah. processor. <laughs> the old just use M4 trope, <laughs> yeah. M4 is fabulous. <laughs> Um, for those who don't know the M4 trope, uh, people would complain that the uh, C macroprocessor was uh, primitive. And the, the reply always was, well, if you don't like it, just use M4. M4 was an advanced text uh, processing uh, processor on uh, Linux. Or on Unix, yeah. Was? <coughs> Autotools is still being run. <laughs> I'm sure M4 is still being run, but I never hear about it anymore. So <laughs> Anybody has to deal with Autotools does, unfortunately, for them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to read the documentation for that once. Ain't nobody got time for that. All right, we have another question from the chat. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that one, but have you guys ever tried the uh, hacks language, H-A-X-E? Uh, it has much to do with what uh, both D and Lua's capabilities are, such as metaprogramming, portability, garbage collection. Uh, you have direct access to the AST using only language constructs, uh, which are on its standard library. Uh, and how do you think that would help or break languages uh, into people having their own feature without directly needing to deal with the interpreter or compiler? I read about it once and I've forgotten it since. The name of the language? Uh, Hax, H-A-X-E. I'm gonna guess that's a no if you've... <laughs> I read about it once, like I said, I've forgotten about it already, so I, I have no opinion. Uh, I've heard of it and... That's about the extent of my knowledge of it, so I can't say anything intelligent about it. Same. Yep, nobody Sorry. knows this language, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have some questions from the audience here. Come on, you know you want to. Hey, down the front. Oh, you've got the mic. Excellent. Uh, so uh, typically, language designers try to avoid complexity, both uh, when users use their language or inside the language implementation. However, sometimes you are forced to make a compromise. And I'm curious, uh, from your past experience, experiences, if you, at what point or if you have an example where you needed to uh, sacrifice simplicity, both in the implementation or in the user-facing 
code just to implement a feature that was maybe needed. So more exactly, where do you draw the line be between having a feature and sacrificing simplicity? Oh boy, uh, that's one of those uh, everything is a judgment call. It's like if you're designing a house and you have an envelope for the house and you want to make the closet bigger, well, which room do you make smaller? <laughs> If, if you look at the, the dwelling that you all live in, you'll realize that everything in it is a compromise. Everything in it. And everything in a programming language is a compromise between uh, what you're getting and what you're giving up. And uh, complexity is, uh, some pro is a problem I've really tried to uh, fight against, but it's... Uh, it's kind of a losing battle. Every new feature adds complexity and interactions. It just, it's a, a very difficult problem to deal with. I, yeah, you've, you've done a great job with in well, Lua in reducing yeah, but, but, this yeah, problem. But the, 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 we do sacrifice complexity, uh, simplicity a lot of times. For instance, in, Lua, in interpreted languages in general, there is a, a, a big problem in the implementation for, its, for optimizations. So sometimes we have to, uh, something it's just slow and you have to implement some more complex data structures and things like that. And it's, uh, for instance, all those, those stuff about table, I mean tables, it's very nice, but all the, the, the algorithms to keep the, the, the table and the array part inside, etc. that all that, uh, I mean, you could have a much simpler implementation of Lua, but actually we did start very, very the, 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 the very first <laughs> Lua, uh, implement uh, version it, it was not even a version at the time tables were actually linked lists with linear search mm -hmm. and it was good enough for what we had in mind at that time so it was just you kept to access field x you just look for that and then i think in version two or somewhere the oh there is a big op Optimization. We get the, the, the element that was accessed and you move it to the front of the list because it's, there is a good chance that you are going to access <laughs> that again. And it, it was good in there. But then after just, I mean, two months, people starting writing more complex stuff and then suddenly, oh, you need a hash table. Okay, so let's do a hash table. But then things, and then, oh, you need something else. And so... Uh, I, I was, but in the design of the language it is the same. I mean, the simplicity or simplicity. I always talk about simplicity, but I mean, you cannot beat lambda calculus. It just, I mean, if you want a real simple language, just do your real programs in lambda calculus. You cannot beat that in simplicity. The, the, the programs won't be that simple, but the language can, cannot be simpler than that. Or oh, it's another example of a language that starts with brain and ends with CK, so um, programs in that are simple. The language is very simple. <laughs> However, it's always a trade-off and it's always a compromise, and it depends on the guiding principles, right? What, what are the goals of this particular language? What is its philosophy? And then the bias of the person making the decisions, you know? Uh, it depends on what mistakes they've made in the past, so they want to avoid those and then disconsider mistakes that other people might make because that's not how their brain operates. And also simplicity in the eyes of whom? Arch Linux is supposedly a very simple distribution in a certain sense, <laughs> but you know, setting it up isn't because the simplicity they're looking for is not uh, trying to make it simple for a user to install it. So that's a set of trade-offs uh, that's completely different from Ubuntu, which is very easy to set up, but doesn't have the simplicity that Arch is looking for uh, in other terms. So it, it depends. Well, there's also a trade-off. If you make the language too simple, what happens is the code you write in that language turns out to be very complicated. Yeah, uh, the language, that calculus, so there's a trade-off. Adding uh, complicated-looking features to the language may make the user code actually much simpler. So the over overall complexity of the, the program can be lower if the language is a little more less simple than, or more, much more less simple than. 
you have to compare the complexity somewhere. So it basically depends on how much it's going to get used and how much it's going to save for the user, pretty much. Yeah, that's why sometimes you want to wire a feature into the language with special syntax, it's worthwhile, and sometimes it should be uh, pushed into the library, like the octal numbers. I didn't, and uh, thought it, its complexity uh, wasn't worth wiring it into the language, but it was certainly worth putting into uh, the runtime library. And you have a complexity budget just like money, right? And people have different priorities with how they want to spend money. Some people want to buy fancy cars, some people want to go to fancy dinners. You can't do both, probably. So it was what you'd spend the language complexity on. What do you consider important? <laughs> Economy or business? All right, I think we'll uh, take one more audience question before we start winding down. So does anybody have a good one? A good question, specifically. This is going to be a good question, right? <laughs> Don't let me down, man. I, I can't necessarily say good, but I think it's important. Um, is that D is a very powerful language and offers a lot of benefits, but for years now it's struggled with kind of popularity and growth. And, it, and it's been over a long time. I think D was created in 2001. Um, and we, there's been entire languages created since then. And, and even then, I, I know D doesn't have a corporate sponsor, but like, take for example the Dart programming language. Dart did have a corporate sponsor, it was developed at Google, but then no one really heard or cared about it until it started being used in the Flutter framework for mobile app development. Um, it seems as if more important than a corporate backer, some flagship project that most people get involved with seems to pull a lot of interest. Do you have any thoughts on could something similar be done with D, some important area, domain, or flagship project to pull people's interest in? Well, could that's, it? That's, yes. That's, yeah, go ahead. Could it? Yes. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One of you might write the, the, that project. I have no idea. Like, yeah, what's going to garner interest? Right, well, at the hackathon, come up with something uh, awesome. It's uh, your responsibility now because you brought it up. Hey, Attila, surely you're talking about this magic project in your talk tomorrow, right? Sure. <laughs> I, I was literally thinking 30 seconds ago how I managed to be here this whole panel without saying, I'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> and you go and ruin it. Well, Ro Roberto mentioned some uh, killer applications we're working with Lua that drove its popularity. So. Yeah, but... We didn't write them. <laughs> right, you didn't. You didn't write them. It 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 has to be the users that yeah. come up with yeah. it. Yeah, but I mean that framework wasn't written by the authors of Dart either. I think is the point. So um, yeah, like you said, when it was a, I think adopted by NASA. By NASA, it would uh, saw Sir Lua. It, well, it saw a surge in popularity. It, 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 no, that it was not adopted by NASA. That's a I mean, there was some guy in NASA that used Lua for some project. Okay, and I then, misunderstood. And someone said it was adopted by NASA. It, it sounds so impressive, but there was some <laughs> some guy working on NASA that he did some I don't know what software he did and he wrote in that Lua. <laughs> okay, but it's a good. Publicity. <laughs> Roberto, where do you use D? In what context? I, I don't use D. <laughs> May I ask why not? Why not? The, I always use only C in Lua. The, the, that's the and everything else. Well, I use uh, Haskell in teaching, and the the, the language I'm. That it's not a programming language, but I, oh, what I'm writing more now is cock. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, I don't. Uh, I don't think I could change cock for a D. <laughs> uh, talk to Walter about better C. Maybe you will have less bugs in your implementation of Lua. So, uh, for what I do, for I, I think C is still a, 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 a very good language I like it so, so there is a, there is a lot of problems but uh, uh, that I'm well aware of but uh, one thing is portability for instance that's uh, that's really really in I mean any machine 
uh, I think no one builds any any kind of CPU without a C compiler. It's like it's, so, it's uh, it's there from the start. And but uh, um, but, but other than that, it's just it's, uh, it would be a big change. But I think uh, portability it's uh, it's really the the. the the killer thing of C, and and it's simple. I mean, if you if you know what you're doing, it can be completely crazy. But if you you can keep things reasonably simple, I, I like that. Um, I'd like to add on the question and ask: How do you actually manage to write portable C with all the undefined behavior and implementation defined behavior, and make sure it's going to be correct everywhere? Pardon me. What's the Question. With all the undefined behavior and implementation defined behaviors in C, how do you actually manage to write correct portable code that is going to uh, conform to the spec? In well, we we try to avoid undefined <laughs> behavior, but I I, I think I, I didn't understand exactly the the the. the um, basically, that maybe some of the code is dependent on implementation-defined things, and if somebody is gonna make an obscure C compiler for obscure hardware, and it might actually break. Yeah, but we try not to. We do the, now. The several compilers have uh, the GCC Clang. They have uh, those. Uh, they have some a lot of detectors, for instance, for undefined stuff. And we use all of these tests, for instance. There, there is some that are completely crazy. You cannot believe that it's undefinable. For instance, you have, you have a, a memory address, and you deallocate the address. You cannot use the. I mean, it, it's not that you cannot access the address anymore. You cannot use the address anymore. So, for instance, there, there, there. We used to have code in Lua that we. We had uh, an, an address, and then we allocate a new one. We moved. It's like like a realloc, but manually done. So we are sure we are changing the memory. So we change that, and then there are some pointers to the old structure. And so we wanted. We wanted. We did that. We subtract the 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 address from the base and add to the new base to to correct the address. This is undefined behavior. Because you cannot use the old address once you deallocated the, 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 the old block. So you can, uh, sorry, you cannot do that with real lock exactly. We have to change to, to do the, the both. So you, you correct the addresses before deallocating the old structure, and then you deallocate the, the old structure. Because if you use real lock, real lock may change and deallocate the old one. And so it's. A, and it's hard sometimes to find though I mean it's not even a bug no one ever complained but we 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 became very strict I mean we we became religious like the, the like it says it's it's that so we are going to follow that the only thing that we are not strict that we explicitly assume is that machines are um, to complement the representation of integers, because but that's not the, uh, because but because C it allows three different representations for integers that can, can be signal magnitude can be complement one and can be one complement and can be two complement and we assume it's two complement otherwise it doesn't work but otherwise. Almost every we did some very strange changes to the to the language because it's it is unbelievable how many uh, everything is undefined behaviors things that could be just for instance you if, if you pass invalid arguments to 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 a lot of functions f open you have a string that says whether you are open for write for read etc. And if it's uh, some letter that it doesn't know, it could be okay. It's an undefined result for the phone. No, it's undefined behavior. Everything can go wrong if you open a file for, for X. 
instead of reading or, or writing. So we have to filter because we, we just, in Lua, you just get that and pass along to, to C. Now we have to filter the, 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 the parameter. We cannot pass that to see what people wrote in Lua. It, it, it's a lot of trouble. That it's really a lot of work, but it's just a mindset, I think, that you really you are convinced that. Well, obviously it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. think your attention to this level of detail no, has made you very people successful. Usually, people you really do tests in a lot of, I mean, I, I only do on my, my Linux, but then once you release some alpha version, people using all kinds of it's different machines and, and then Exactly anything people report, we, we go there and see what's happening, etc. And, and sometimes we try to, it's the problem of the, we, we found a lot of bugs in compilers because, that's it. <laughs> but then sometimes, it, depending who is the compiler, if it's Microsoft, we just, okay, it's the, the, the bug, we, we have to leave, it's our, we, we have to correct that, that's, it's their bug, but it's our problem, but if it's, <laughs> if that it's but we did find many, many bugs in, in, in C compilers along the years. It's not just us, it's not just us. <laughs> Yeah, but interesting. You said when uh, uh, when you have a you find a bug in Microsoft's compiler, it's your problem. But when you find a bug in some minor outfits compiler, it's their problem. <laughs> and that's life. That's, yeah. that's the state yeah. of the industry. Yeah. We we try to make the Microsoft problem too, but yeah. it's unbelievable that, 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 that some horrible bugs. There in, it, oh, yeah. I used to have and, a C compiler. And, 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 and stupid ones. I mean, they, they could fix that in, in three minutes. But <laughs> and, Well, I used to sell a C compiler, and I would get this all the time. People go, well, your compiler has a bug in it. you got to fix the compiler right away. And I go, well, what do you do if you find a bug in Microsoft's compiler? Oh, we work around it. <laughs> yeah. that's, just, that's just the way things work. Yeah, life is not fair. All right, we've got to start wrapping up here. So uh, let's end it on a uh, fun, easy question. So uh, if you didn't uh, get into language design and language authorship, uh, how do you think your professional life might have gone? Or I guess in Walter's case, your retirement. <laughs> oh, well, D started because I retired. And six weeks of watching TV, I was done with that. I was going back to work. <laughs> There was really nothing else you could would have done in retirement, like get into cars or something, or uh, maybe car racing. <laughs> <laughs> another another interest of mine. <laughs> I have no idea. I never planned to be a language. This I never planned to work with programming languages. I think I, I mostly never planned anything in my life for more than like. Yeah, that's Two how months I, in advance, I was just following the flow. And yeah, I mean, that's how I wound up in Europe myself, so. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's difficult to, I didn't think the first option is, you were know, asking for a second option, that's too. Oh, well, weirdly enough, if I had enough money to retire tomorrow, I'd design my own language. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I would do. That's how I keep, you know, spend my time. I'd probably like work half time with D and half time creating this this new thing, which would probably have macros, by the way. Uh, well, we'll, we'll make, probably I mean definitely. We'll make sure you you you, you can't retire, Attila. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I thought somebody's gonna give me an anonymous donation of ten million Swiss francs so I could retire. <laughs> Darn it! I don't want to leave Switzerland. <laughs> you you get to be picky once when, when you live in Switzerland. Yeah, so um, same as Roberto, I didn't really choose it and just ended up there. So that's life. All right, so you know we've got the right people for the job. All they ever want to do is design languages. <laughs> All right. right uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, we've got a quarter to six, which is great time to finish it up. So uh, 
Thank you, Walter, Roberto, Attila, and I'm still going to pronounce it wrong, Roy. Yeah, it's closer than I have been. Give it up for these guys.